Yeah, I think so. Well, maybe just two on this. The one there. Yeah, maybe just two on each table. Okay, this works. Um, hi, everybody, um, and welcome to our session on confidence building measures um, in cyberspace and sort of the, the road forward uh, for this area. I want to welcome everybody in the room. I also want to welcome people online uh, that uh, are participating remotely. And, um, you know, we have an online moderator um, on site. So if you have questions, please type them into the tool and he will make sure that we know the questions and are able to answer them. Um, the conversation today will look at um, sort of how far have we gotten in terms of confidence building measures for cyberspace, um, why they're important, um, as well as sort of what is the path forward and what is the path forward for um, multi-stakeholder engagement in terms of confidence building measures. Um, I am hopeful that we will have an interesting and engaging debate both here on the panel and with the audience. I have a number of questions, but as you listen to the presentations, please sort of, if you have questions, um, think about them and after this first round of remarks to level set the discussion, um, I highly encourage you to raise your hand and uh, participate. The, the idea, as with many things at IGF, is for this to actually be a conversation amongst us all. Um, with that, I want to thank all of our panelists here. And um, I will ask Nicolas Ott from the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe to start us on the way and sort of give us an overview of what confidence building measures are, as well as some of the work that he personally and the OEC more generally has been doing in this space. Thanks a lot, Kaya. Um, so it's great to have slides and then realize that you get to go first only because you have the slides and people want to get rid of them. So we'll quickly go through them. Um, they help me to stay on track, so I'm not going to waste your time for too long. Um, so let's kick things off. Um, we in the OEC um, have um, quite an interesting mandate that I'm going to go through in the next couple of minutes. Um, for those of you who do not know the OEC, we are uh, the world's largest uh, regional security organization with 57 uh, participating states in North America, Europe, and Asia. Um, and uh, our focus is pretty much on um, enhancing stability, peace, and democracy for more than a billion people in those regions. Some of you might know us from our election observation efforts. Uh, the special monitoring mission in Ukraine, or our conflict prevention and mediation efforts. Now, to understand where sort of our approach towards CBMs is uh, coming from, um, we have to look back a little bit into the 1970s, um, where things kicked off as a multilateral forum for um, countries uh, east and west during the Cold War, which uh, ultimately ended up with the Helsinki Final Act in 1975 which is sort of the foundational layer to our work and also sets sort of the framework in which we observe and see how we contribute to enhancing um, our being a platform for cooperation amongst uh, states. Um, based on this uh, Helsinki Final Act, we um, approach security-related issues through three dimensions. The political military dimension, economic and envir environmental, and the human rights perspective. And this helps us um, to sort of frame uh, discussions along those lines and figure out how al also these three dimensions sort of complement and support each other. Um, moreover, and this is also quite important, the OEC works on a basis of political consensus. So decisions are not taken, are not agreed upon uh, uh, if there is opposition or dissent 
by any of our participating states. We are not entirely new to um, the CBMs. Um, when we look at conventional arms control, the OEC has been quite active in enhancing our uh, CSBMs. So the S stands for stability measures there, that's added. Um, and therefore, what uh, participating states agreed upon ultimately was to translate this approach toward um, sort of modern day uh, security challenges and therefore um, apply sort of the concept of confidence building measures into uh, cyberspace. Um, this slide uh, just shows you a few pictures to remind everyone in the room, and I'm sure most of you know that already. We're obviously not operating in a political vacuum, so um, this is happening with an environment of sort of uh, tensions, of, of conflict, of disagreement, and so the CBMs very much try to address that and figure out how within this political realm that we're operating in, we can enhance relations between states. Before I even mention what exactly our CBMs entail, I wanted to quickly put this here uh, on screen so that people uh, are aware of this interconnectedness between sort of the regional approaches on uh, confidence building measures and what uh, the United Nations has been doing over the, <clears throat> over the past couple of years. The UNGGE four pillar approach is, is quite helpful for us to also stay on track and make sure that uh, our efforts um, are line up with what is happening on a global level. Now, I know that uh, the font size is rather small and it not, the purpose is not to go through every of these lines. That will take too long. The idea here is to show you the three clusters on how we approach our, uh, our CBMs. Um, <clears throat> we have two comprehensive sets of CBMs adopted in 2013 and 2016, and here you can see all 16 of them clustered in three different um, clusters. The first one is posturing, which can be broadly categorized as CBMs that um, help uh, states to read each other and understand each other. Communication CBMs that help states to enhance their information sharing, their means of communications, establishing communication lines. And then thirdly, preparedness, which are CBMs that are designed to uh, promote national readiness on this matter. I'll give you concrete examples of those in just a minute. But before that, I just wanted to quickly sort of put this question out there because we've received this question quite often. I think it's important to address this right away um, is why do we even have regional organizations address these matters, be it either capacity building or CBMs? And this is where sort of our unique mandate, but also our expertise in the field comes along. Uh, it's not just the OEC, but you know, the, uh, the ASEAN Regional Forum and the uh, Organization of American States who are also engaged in the space. Um, we as entities that do a lot of practical work underground sort of have a, a fairly good understanding of what's happening there and how this also reflects and can be incorporated into uh, international discussions. Um, we therefore talk um, quite often as sort of this incubator and implementer approach, um, meaning an incubator for new ideas and practical efforts that relate to international law and norms, and as implementer of agreed upon language like, like the UNGGE uh, reports uh, that obviously are on a very high level, but then obviously need to be implemented and translate into more practical means uh, to be uh, effective um, in their own way. <laughs> Now, to complete my introductory remarks, I thought I'd, I'd finish off with three concrete examples uh, of uh, capacity building, uh, trust building, and awareness building. When it comes to capacity building, um, the way we approach this is um, the OEC Secretariat uh, started a new initiative called CBM Implementation Roadmaps, where we go uh, and meet counterparts in participating states who are interested in receiving customized support um, in figuring out how they can take advantage of our CBM portfolio, incorporate them into national policy structures, integrate them into their, uh, their national procedures uh, and institutions to not just have them out there as an option, but really have a coherent way of making use of them. The second example that I wanted to give you on trust building is our points of contact network 
which um, serves as a community among um, policy and technical experts that are not just brought together from time to time, but go through fictitious scenarios together. We do tables of exercises for them, and we really bring them together because we see that you know, trust building is, an essential, is essential, but it only works if we bring back sort of the, the human component and make sure that people meet, that they engage and go through challenges by themselves. By now, we also do unannounced communication checks. So um, sometimes we uh, surprise our participating states with uh, a long email and lots of tasks, and suddenly they have to respond to this in 72 hours. Uh, they do it very diligently, um, um, but then sometimes we hear that uh, the task might have been, um, could have been a little simpler, but we're happy to uh, challenge them a little bit to figure out how they can uh, work on that effectively. And then last thing that I wanted to say uh, as an example was um, an awareness raising where we go into the field and we have, we conduct sub-regional workshops where we bring together policymakers from a specific region and then help them understand how within their own work, CBMs, but also norms and other components of the four GG pillars actually complement their work, uh, make their lives easier and how they actually, these, these pillars relate to their national responsibilities. So overall, you might uh, think that, that the CBMs itself might be narrow, but within the realm, they actually do provide a crucial component to the reduction of, of conflict. They might not make uh, front newspaper uh, uh, coverage, but among diplomats, they are actually uh, greatly appreciated and, and help them sort of navigate a landscape that sometimes is dominated by a low level of trust or difficult or tensious relationships. Um, and then therefore, we as a secretariat are very much focused on implementing these agreed upon norms and help and support our participating states and figure out how to take most out of this uh, language that has been agreed upon. Um, you will see when some of you go to the CBM portfolio and look at the language that sounds, might sound very trivial, very easy, that's because CBMs are designed to start with less contentious issues that offer a starting point that actually do help um, find agreement on things that everyone agrees upon, and then from there you can walk towards more, um, more ambitious goals in that sense. Uh, I'll leave it at that, and I'm looking forward to our conversation and questions from the audience. Thank you. Thank you, Nicholas. Um, I think that was a very useful sort of overview of the background from you know, how the world in reality, you know, OSE as an example, but move from competence building measures in your traditional not online environment to this space and give and gave some examples of how this might work. With with that, I want to turn to Caroline Greer, who's a head of the European Public Policy at Cloudfair, to perhaps give us a little bit of an overview of the the landscape that we see online today and why we actually need confidence building measures and sort of the industry perspective of how, how we could um, effectively increase stability in cyberspace. Yeah, great, thanks very much and thanks for the, the invitation to, to join this panel. Um, CBMs is a new acronym for us, I must confess, for me certainly, um, but definitely the, the thrust of, of what you're saying makes a lot of sense. So um, I guess to place us in this debate as a private sector actor, as a company, um, for those not familiar with, with Cloudflare, we are a web security company that was formed in 2010. So we currently protect about 20 million plus web properties around the world. And we're present in some 90 countries across 194 cities. So we really have a globally distributed network. Um, to give you an idea of the, the sense or the, the, the scale of the, the cyber attacks that we're confronted with, which are, I guess, at the most simple level, DDoS attacks growing up to, to very more um, sophisticated attacks. In quarter three of this year, um, we blocked on average 72 billion cyber attacks daily each day. So that's the kind of scale of, of things that we're doing with. And they, they range from you know, sort of basic attacks all the way up to super sophisticated attacks. Um, we are a member of the Cyber Tech Accord along with, with Microsoft and some, some industry peers. And we are a signatory of the, the Paris call, um, which was signed last year, November last year, and brought private sector actors and others together to, to kind of talk about how to deal with malicious attacks online and how to deal with accessibility and integrity of the net and to look at electoral processes, uh, among other things. So. I guess where we find ourselves in, in this uh, discussion is 
To the extent, I mean, we, we have a full range of customers ranging from free users right up to, to government entities. So to the extent that we, we don't talk about customers specifically, but we are you know, protecting web properties of governments, of parliaments, of stock exchanges, uh, national regulatory agencies, election websites. So to the extent that we're protecting these web properties from, from cyber attacks, um, particularly in states where perhaps the, the democratic um, situation is shaky, let's say, um, or where there's a national crisis ongoing, we can find ourselves inadvertently as a private sector actor in the middle of some sort of geopolitical situation um, where one of our customers is being attacked um, in the context of a geopolitical situation. Um, what do we do as a private sector actor in that case? So it's kind of unclear what the playbook is there. Obviously, we, we see you know things that are happening on our network. Um, but as an internet infrastructure company, as a security company, we, we don't take sides. Politics is not our game. We're content neutral. So it's you know it's, it's clear and a little confusing as to what we should be doing in that situation. Obviously, we have to protect our customers as well, and user trust is, is paramount for us. So, you know, the type of information that we could share is perhaps limited. But to the extent that we're also getting questions um, from state entities as to, you know, what are you seeing in this situation? What kind of level of information sharing can we give? What, what are the rules uh, in that situation? So that's something that, that we think about a lot. Um, we're not really in the game necessarily of attribution. I think it's a lot of difficulties in dealing with attribution, but for sure we, we see some, some things that are happening. So for us, I think that's probably the biggest discussion today. What is the role of a private sector entity who inadvertently ends up in the middle of some sort of state actor attack, um, and how do we address that? So those would be my introductory remarks, willing to talk about that a bit further, but um, that, I guess, sets us in the scene of this debate, if that's helpful. Thank you. Uh, th thank you. That's very helpful. I think it, it's a very interesting perspective to to take and to think about as we go forward. Because in in reality, uh, private sector actors are both, you know, the developers, the the operators, and a lot of the times the defenders and sort of the targets of of the these nation state um, efforts. And but we don't necessarily participate as much as in confidence building measures in, in norms conversations uh, at all. And I know that, and this is one of the questions I'll have later for everybody. I know the part of the conversation next week at the UN uh, at the UN at the open and the working group um, conversations will really focus on how do you build confidence building measures not just between states, but actually between the different um, the different stakeholders. I guess multi-stakeholders, though I don't think that's a word, um, you know, with, between industry and government, between civil society and industry, between civil society and government to, to drive this discussion forward. I think maybe I want to turn to Siturai Pondraj, to, um, who um, comes from the Singapore Cybersecurity Agency. Singapore has been really leading um, in, in, in the Asia-Pacific regions and some of these efforts in this space. And I know you're also highly, highly active participants uh, at the UN conversations. And, and maybe, you know, we've mentioned it here for, um, I have, uh, Nicholas has. Um, what, could you tell us a little bit about what you're doing um, as a country, but also uh, what is happening at the UN level to drive this conversation forward? So thank you. I have got a, a big job because I, I, I feel I don't represent just uh, Singapore, but I also represent my colleagues in the ASEAN Regional Forum who are who, doing lots of work. The ASEAN Regional Forum intersessional meeting on uh, ICT security, for example, is co-chaired by Singapore, Malaysia, and Japan. And uh, it's, it's a grouping not just made up of the 10 uh, Association of Southeast Asian country, nations, uh, grouping, which is ASEAN. But we are also privileged to have uh, 10 other people, 10 other countries, uh, including the US, Russia, and China. So you know, it's an interesting perspective. And then we have seven more. So the 27 countries in the ASEAN Regional Forum in this ISM for ICT security. And uh, I just wanted to situate where we, we are in terms of the conversation in, in Southeast Asia. And then I'll, I'll speak a little bit about the UN uh, uh, multi-stakeholder consults next week. 
Uh, in ASEAN, uh, I think, as it can be seen, uh, it is not natural for sometimes to have someone from the cybersecurity agency to come and speak about digital diplomacy or cyber diplomacy, but that's a reality because the truth is we, we have seen in ASEAN that the cybersecurity is actually an enabler of economic progress. It is something that makes the smart nation initiatives, the IoT initiatives, the digital future possible. So uh, the ASEAN ministers have, since 2016, 2015, have spoken about the importance of cybersecurity. They're like brakes on a sports car. If you have a sports car and you want to go fast, it's good to have good brakes. If not, you'll be going very fast, but you will not be able to stop. So what happened is that we received a, a very clear guidance on, on this in 2018 during Singapore's chairmanship. The ASEAN leaders for the first time issued a statement on cybersecurity cooperation. And many of the things that Nicholas spoke about in the UN Four Approaches Pillar for cyber stability, namely norms, rules, and principles, uh, uh, international cooperation, international law, application of international law, as well as CBMs, were mentioned in this statement as key things that ASEAN countries should work on, but also in a multi-stakeholder way. And so just to add before I go into CBMs, uh, during the ASEAN Ministerial Conference on Cybersecurity in 2018, the ministers, the ASEAN ICT and Cybersecurity ministers, agreed to subscribe uh, officially, formally, in principle, to the 11 norms of behavior, state behavior in cyberspace that were contained in the 2015 UNGGE report. And just this year's meeting in, in Singapore, they've decided to set up a working committee to come up with a roadmap to implement these norms. So where do, where do confidence building measures fit in? So through the leadership, uh, we set up the ARF, ISM, and ICTs. And our perspective has been that confidence building measures are just so important in a region of 10 countries which are so diverse not just in capacity, but also in terms of history, in terms of language, in terms of values, that confidence building then becomes even more urgent and important. Uh, taking from Nicholas's point and, uh, and the point made earlier that confidence building measures are a practical way of implementing cooperation. So we have come up with uh, five proposals which are being implemented, but they were understood from the fact that the landscape, the cyber landscape in each country is very different. Uh, for example, when, we, when Singapore wanted to host a conference on cybersecurity for ASEAN ministers, uh, our minister invited the ICT minister in each country, and we also sent an invite to whomsoever it may concern. Because truly, we, there were different people looking at cybersecurity, different ministers looking at cybersecurity. So when we started the efforts to CBMs, you will notice that our five CBM proposals were meant to look at uh, practical ways of increasing trust and confidence in a very fragmented or different landscape where different countries have different ways of organizing themselves for cybersecurity. So we worked with our partners and we work with partners like the EU, uh, with, with Australia, with, you know, as, a, as a region and we have proposals on points of contact. So we have approved the points of contact directory where each country is now exchanging points of contact who can be contacted. We also have a, 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 a sharing of information, domestic laws, national policies and strategies, a proposal and protection of critical infrastructures, awareness raising information on uh, information sharing and emergency responses, and also on the principles of building security in ICT's use. Why these are important is because these are areas in which we can quickly bring the whole region together to speak to each other, share our experiences, share our perspectives, and hit the priorities that are necessary. But a key point here, and this has been reflected in our discussions, and this is where the multi-stakeholder approach is important, I'd like to segue to that, is all this works in a region which is very diverse only because there is a concerted and coordinated effort at uh, capacity building. There it needs to be capacity, not just in technical matters, in operational matters. And I, and I think that uh, my, my co-panelists spoke about the incident response, the need to understand threats is just so important. 
and, and this is something that we do. But it's also important to build capacity in things, in areas like strategy, in legislation, in setting up a cert and giving it a mandate. So the sharing of information becomes very important. The sharing of strategies becomes very important. So I think that uh, in, in Bangkok, we have a center which is run by Thailand and Japan, the ASEAN Japan Center on Capacity Building. Singapore has invested $30 million on a center of excellence for cyber capacity building. And key among, among all the things that we do is to build capacity for countries in the region to develop their own governance models to build their ability to work within their own systems, to engage with each other, each, with other countries in the region internationally, but also with industry. So many of our capacity building efforts, uh, I'm happy to say, are not run by government trainers. We work with many different companies, Microsoft and others, as well as civil society, NGOs, universities to deliver capacity building because the perspective that multi-stakeholders bring to this conversation is important. I'll just end off by the UN, talking about the UN intersectional stakeholder consultation next week, which will happen uh, from Monday to Wednesday in New York. Singapore will be chairing it under the chair of the Swiss and the OEWG. And I think uh, one of the key uh, facts which, which has been brought up is that we would like to hear how multi-stakeholders can support the efforts, the discussions which have already gone on in the UN to build a rules-based cyberspace and to equip countries with, and, and countries with the structures and, uh, and the thinking and the strategies necessary to continue building a rules-based cyberspace that inspires trust and confidence. And it's all built on the basis that when we have stability in cyberspace, then it is possible to have not just economic progress, but better living standards for the 630 million people living in ASEAN today. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think that really touched on a, on a lot of areas that, um, that, that sort of that influence this space. And I think it's uh, they are really critical that we don't forget. I think uh, you know it's the same actually in OECE. I think the the diversity of stakeholders that talk to each other, even the government to government, is dramatic, you know, you, in, in your region, you know, Singapore versus Laos are at very different levels of ICT development um, in, in OSCE, um, you know, Belgium versus uh, Belarus are probably also fairly different. So, um, so thinking about how, how do you ensure that you lift everybody up um, going forward is, is something to definitely think about as, as we go into this conversation. I also see, I think, the Global Forum for Cyber Ex Security Expertise somewhere at the back of the room. So um, I will encourage them to, to sort of chime into the discussion later on. But with that, I wanted to turn to, um, to, to see the, the, the European Union perspective on this. Um, we have um, Caroline Guffley here from the External Action Service who um, will hopefully tell us a little bit about um, uh, capacity building efforts um, and confidence building measure efforts in a, uh, both in a slightly more cohesive environment and sort of how, how does that differ um, and sort of uh, give a European perspective for the future. Um, thank you very much. I'm Camille Gufflet from the European External Action Service. Um, so CBMs are not really new for me. I was previously working on disarmament and control, uh, arms control. So it has been interesting since I joined the EAS to see how CBMs uh, have been uh, translated in the cyber domain and how they can be also effectively implemented. Um, for the EU um, and its member state, uh, there is a clear um, um, appreciation that CBMs are a practical means for conflict uh, prevention and uh, building effective mechanism of state interaction in cyberspace, but as um, elsewhere, is essential to reduce the likelihood of a conflict. Um, so my, my presentation will focus on three points of uh, EU efforts. First, uh, in terms of transparency of, um, in the European Union region. Uh, then, uh, what are the cooperative measures we are promoting uh, in our external um, relation, but also how we contribute to the wider stability at multilateral level. 
So first, uh, about transparency and reliability, uh, there are measures that provide insight into states' activities, and they contribute to a void room of in misinterpretation of action and escalation of conflict. So in that regard, the EU um, uh, aims to strengthen first um, its uh, cyber defenses and resilience, also to increase awareness of businesses and citizens, and thirdly, to promote increased transparency on uh, cybersecurity issues. So the EU response uh, is first and foremost directed at improving its own uh, cyber resilience, and as adopted in 2017, a joint communication on resilience, uh, deterrence, defense, and to build a strong cybersecurity for the EU. Um, the centerpiece uh, of this uh, efforts is the NIST directive that you certainly heard about. It's the first EU-wide legislation on uh, cybersecurity, and it includes uh, member state preparedness by mandating the establishment of national strategies on security of networks and information system. It also includes the participation of the businesses uh, that will have to take appropriate uh, security measures and to notify serious incidents to the relevant authorities. Um, we are also taking other internal measures on adopting uh, a communication from the Commission on securing three and fair election. And going forward, we just also agreed the EU Cybersecurity Act uh, that reinforces the mandate of the ENISA, which is the ad internal agency in charge of the cybersecurity, uh, so to better support the member state uh, of the EU to address cyber threats, uh, and also establish a framework for cybersecurity certification, so to uphold the level of all EU member states uh, on the security of their products and services. So this model is evolving, um, and it's also a good basis to engage with the third partners, um, because uh, besides uh, strengthening our own resilience, we aim to strengthen the global resilience, uh, which is clearly in our interest. Um, global resilience is a crucial element to maintaining, to maintaining international peace and security. And it reduces also the ability of potential perpetrators to misuse ICTs for malicious purposes and strengthen the ability of all states to effectively respond to and recover from uh, cyber threats. So after this insight into the EU's activities uh, that are concrete steps toward the sharing best practices and also facilitating uh, effective dialogue, I would like to focus now more on the cooperative measures that all also uh, efforts toward uh, implementing effectively uh, CBMs. Um, so the EU aims to promote collaboration between states uh, based on a mutual commitment, which is essential to developing the trust required for promoting an open, free, stable, and secure cyberspace. Um, we are uh, working towards effective cooperation among the international uh, community. Um, we deepen regular dialogue with the partners uh, to develop and implement effective confidence building measures, but also to demonstrate willingness to settle international disputes by peaceful means. Uh, we have been engaged in the development and implementation of the two sets of CBMs in the OSCE. We are also actively participating in the uh, ASEAN Regional Forum, and uh, we are co-sponsoring with Singapore a CBM on the protection of critical infrastructure. So first, uh, so those are essential steps to uh, contribute to, um, to the security and uh, stability in the cyberspace. Um, Clearly, dialogue contributes to building trust and confidence uh, for exchanging best practices, promoting human rights, democracy, and the rule of law, improving security, but as well as tackling uh, issues of common uh, concern to better prevent, uh, detect, and deter respond to malicious cyber activities. Um, in that regard, uh, the EU has adopted a framework for a uh, diplomatic response um, to mitigate uh, cybersecurity threats and also to look for uh, greater stability in 
this international relations and uh, this EU cyber toolbox that uh, is um, that we uh, exp well present uh, also includes as a very first step uh, in preventive and cooperative measures the implementation of effective uh, CBMs. Um, so it's not only a response to the threat, but also a, a, tool, a toolbox uh, to have a long-term uh, stability. Um, of course, in, um, in all our efforts, we engage uh, constructively with the non-state actors uh, that should act in synergy with, um, with the joint efforts uh, of go governments, uh, also therefore the private sector, civil society, technical community. Uh, and in that regard, uh, EU member states have supported the Paris School of Trust and Security in the cyberspace and its commitment and uh, we note that this initiative came at a time uh, last year when the international cooperation and multilateralism was uh, being challenged uh, more than ever. Um, I would like just uh, briefly also touch upon the stability and the capacity building efforts uh, of the EU um, um, because besides reducing the likelihood of conflict, uh, the European Union, uh, along with, with its member states, uh, are willing to build stability. Uh, we promote the rules-based international order, effective multilateralism, and effective global governance uh, with the aim to advance stability in the cyberspace. Um, there is this uh, re respecting international law and uploading the consensus that international law apply in the cyberspace uh, is essential, and it comes along with the implementation of a responsible norm of, uh, uh, norms of responsible state behavior. Uh, but uh, as it was also mentioned in the presentation of Nicolas, it's part of a whole uh, uh, global measures uh, that uh, is uh, co-reinforcing each other's and uh, including the CBMs. Um, in terms of um, Capacity buildings, um, we think that providing assistance uh, is essential for international, international security, and the EU has invested uh, substantially in strengthening the cyber ca capacity as of uh, third countries. We are contributing to different organizations, to bilateral. Um, relation, but also through a uh, new uh, center, has, uh, has been mentioned, the Center uh, of e Singapore and ASEAN Center of Excellence of Cyber Security. But more for the um, cyber diplomacy part, uh, I just wanted to mention the EU Cyber Direct project uh, that support uh, our efforts um, and consequently to contribute to the development of secure, stable and right-based order and uh, they are um, supporting our efforts and dialogue with uh, strategic partners like Brazil, China, India, Japan, South Korea, and the United Nations, but also our work on CBMs in the regional regions uh, in Latin America and Asia Pacific, as well as the OSC. Um, so um, thank you very much and happy to answer your question. Yeah, thank you. And I th think with that, we did sort of a, like a world world tour of, of both the private sector and different regional perspectives on, and, and on the world of CBMs. And I actually, you know, thinking about something that you said at the beginning of the presentation, I uh, wanted to ask you, Camille, but like obviously anybody on the panel, please feel free to chime in. Um, how? How is cyber and CBMs for cyber different from the traditional environment? I think we've heard a few examples. Obviously, the, the industry role is one of them. Uh, but um, the, I think the challenges with attribution probably apply, apply more in this space than in others. But what, what has your experience been? Um. So I will say that what I've noticed is that the CBMS search are not so different. This is uh, based on uh, efforts on uh, transparency, uh, sharing information, opening lines of communication, facilitating uh, cooperation, 
uh, fostering an understanding, protecting the infrastructure, uh, but also responding to threat. So this is just all, uh, the degree of implementation that is different, uh, the kind of uh, actors that are uh, connecting together. I would say um, also in regard with the private sector role, it's uh, clear that uh, in this uh, interconnected uh, cyberspace, uh, we need to, uh, to be more involved with the private sectors through this kind of forum. Uh, we've said that the open-ended working group is uh, CBMs uh, in itself, but I would say that IGF as well. Um, and, um, and in in the set of CBMs of the OSC, there is this uh, dimension of the public and private uh, partnership. So it's been a long time also in the view of uh, member states that uh, they need to engage with the private sector that uh, are owning most of the infrastructure in the cyberspace. Any comments from you? <laughs> Wonderful transition. Uh, thank you, Kimi. Uh, yes, so we do have an explicit reference on uh, public-private partnership, especially when it comes to uh, critical infrastructure protection uh, within our set of CBMs. The, the one thing that I wanted to mention where I think things are different is not so much in how the, the CBMs are designed, but rather how they're implemented and incorporated. Because there is what we see that um, it's not just um, sort of a military to military or MFA to MFA engagement, but a whole of government and to a certain extent also a whole of society uh, responsibility of figuring out how these agreements that are they're made um, across uh, the globe can be properly put into, uh, into practice. And this is what we see over and over again when we engage in our capacity building efforts, that it's actually quite useful to bring uh, non-governmental experts into uh, the discussions to really figure out how this can be done effectively, because the expertise is there, the knowledge is oftentimes there, it's just a matter of how to properly connect the dots. Um, and therefore, this also kind of feeds into our whole discussion about capacity building, um, which is becoming more more important, and I'm glad that, uh, in fact, we have GFC representatives in the room. So if you ever want to learn about how capacity building is coordinated in a really a really good way, um, in the back, there are your experts that can help you out in figuring out how this can be best done. Thank you. Um, do you want to go? Yeah, so I just want to echo that. I, I think the, for example, even if you, even if you don't look at it from a, from a public-private partnership in a, in, a, in a very purist way, the, the idea is that even from a security operational perspective, you need to work with the critical information infrastructure operators who are private industry. And uh, one of the key problems, uh, which I think Caroline spoke about, is, is the need to share information in a timely and relevant way. Uh, and I think that uh, that's where it's different when it's between states previously. And here the confidence is built not just between states, but it's also built with the critical information infrastructure people, the, the, pe the companies which are, which are monitoring threats. And we need to figure out a way to open lines of communication in a timely and relevant way. And that all adds to the confidence that's built. And that's the real challenge before us today. I think that's how it's qualitatively different. I would, I would agree. I think maybe you know building on that and sort of again inviting others to to chime in um, is given the complexity of, of these conversations um, and you know oftentimes we've seen uh, CBMs implemented within regional groups and regional organizations. Sometimes they're bilateral. Um, today with the industry industry input and like civil society input to an extent, how, how do you, do you build these relationships just within a country first and then you bring it forward? Or do you, do you build them, continuously build them at an international level? Well, what would you think is a good path forward? Anyone? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, at least from a private sector perspective. I mean, the, the NIST directive, um, Network and Information Security um, uh, Systems Directive in the EU has been really useful for us in terms of building relationships with the national governments. I mean, we are an operator of essential service as defined under that directive for some of our services. So those are brand new relationships with some regulators uh, nationally. Um, admittedly, the directive is sort of transposed differently in each country and it's challenging to, to find out um, what countries are doing nationally. but. Um, that's a really great starting point for us, and it's a really great 
relationship that we now have built up in several countries where we can talk about the types of attacks that we're seeing and the protections that we're taking and build a trusted relationship such that we can sort of share that information um, that, that we have. Yeah. I think within um, our approach um, toward the CBMs, we really see that the CBMs serve as an encouragement for states to engage with uh, their private sector in very concrete efforts, but we as um, Secretariat don't directly engage with national entities or private sectors that are engaged in a certain country. We see there's a lot of uh, stimulating discussions between the national governments and uh, private sector and civil society that's active in that field, and that is then uh, oftentimes brought back and channeled through uh, national represent uh, representatives into the discussions uh, within the OEC. Okay, I think I think with that probably it, I think it brings me back to capacity building. I think because the um, you, our experience has been, and I think that's obviously also. Um, a, fairly straightforward, you, you, you kind of almost, you get from the industry what you, you put in, right? You need to understand what questions to ask, you need to understand, you need to also be able to prioritize risk to a large extent. Um, how, how do you ensure that um, going forward we can equip countries uh, in this space. Obviously, you talked a little bit about the, 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 the cyber the centers of excellence. You talked about the EU efforts. But how do, how do we equip countries around the world? And actually, also, how do you equip industry around the world? So it's not just the, you know, a few large, um, sophisticated providers that can engage with this effort um, that, um, to be able to have that conversation. I'll just venture into this. <laughs> I think the two things that we have realized, and we realize this because we make mistakes and not because we were correct. <laughs> and uh, the first is um, the understanding that the, there are many different levels of, uh, of capacity building needed. And uh, something that we decided not to do from the very beginning is something we called hit and run uh, capacity building. Let me explain. So, for example, we used to have three or four days of, of capacity building, maybe on forensics or malware testing or anything. Now, what does it mean at the end of four days? What do you tell the minister who is sending his people? Uh, congratulations, the person who attended is now an expert in... It, it can't be. So, uh, one of the key things is what we have tried to do is work in partnership with industry and um, Interpol and other organizations to say that we will have a sustained three-year program with, uh, with metrics. So, we can say to that person, the ministers or whoever is sending their, their officials, that at the end of three years, and so that's what Singapore does, we, we insist that all our programs are three years, we work with industry for three years to design the programs. So at the end of three years, we can tell them, look, your, probably your, your, your official is not going to be able to do the sort of things that you think he's able to do, but he's able or she is able to do some of these things. So we have taken on a responsible way of reporting. Uh, one of our challenges is then to, to figure out how to have metrics. So we're working with GFCE. We are very great supporters of GFCE uh, to come up with metrics. And we can't do this without industry because industry is a, has already worked out many of these programs, many of these expertise levels. Now it's to bring the industry into the conversation to help then facilitate. So I, I was going to just answer your previous question. That's where regional organizations can play such a great role because we can sort of uh, tap on the synergies and to, to bring the whole region and to come up with metrics which individual countries may not be able to standardize for themselves because it's, as you said, it's, the capacities are so diverse. So one of the key things is, I, I thought, the quick win is to, is to bring industry and multiple stakeholders to, to actually reflect on sustained, coordinated capacity building and concrete outcomes. And that's powerful. Because then, and what we tell all the, all the industry that come and take part in Singapore's capacity building programs is, actually, we would like to see an outcome where the country representatives coming for capacity building then come to this company and tell them, thank you very much for the training. Actually, we, 
by, by coming for this training, we realize we have so much more to do. We'd like to invite you to our country to continue the training. So this is how we have uh, tried to do it now. How successful, I'll tell you in three years' time. <laughs> <laughs> Good luck, I would say. <laughs> um, um, I think maybe that almost brings me back to sort of, so what are, you know, we talked about metrics. What are some of good examples of um, capacity and confidence building measures that work? How do you make them work? What are some of the best practices there? And I think from what I'm hearing, a lot of it is um, continued engagement is and, and literally working on small projects together. But am I right? Um, well, what has, have your experiences been? I think you're hitting in the uh, right direction. We are exactly looking at how um, we can find means to encourage states to engage in, in this vast amount uh, of measures, be it on coordinated vulnerability structure and figuring out how they can learn from each other's best practices, uh, critical infrastructure protection, sharing strategies and explaining each other how sort of their national governance structures work. I think just being a platform um, and bringing these stakeholders together who might not see, or might not agree on a lot of things, but um, ultimately you know, have to work with each other and um, figure out how to sort of find agreements. Um, that's uh, indeed quite helpful. Uh, the one thing that we see is uh, very much appreciated uh, and is now also reflected by ASEAN and by the OAS is this points of contact network. I think this is something that uh, has been uh, building and maturing over the last years and we see that there's very strong interest in, in, in moving this forward and establishing sort of a strong community amongst uh, policymakers. And this, I think, also goes to show how uh, this issue that uh, tended to be rather technical or was focused in a niche is now also receiving more and more interest by uh, um, diplomats and policymakers from the more traditional sense to figure out how this issue can be incorporated into sort of the, the broader international relations environment um, that uh, those actors are engaging in. Um, so that, that's an in, interesting question. I don't really know if uh, CBMs are really quantifiable uh, because uh, how to measure trust and cooperation between the states. Um, so in terms of uh, concrete efforts to implement them, I would say that uh, from the example of Nicolas on the uh, exercise uh, communication check, uh, I guess we answer <laughs> to the um, to the email that we received. The, indeed, the point of contact uh, is really a first and um, uh, concrete steps uh, to establish um, a network to cooperate and to share information. Um, the valu valuable of a regional uh, organization is really to have a platform with a schedule and times uh, and meetings uh, to share information, uh, to have an agenda on, uh, yes, concretely, what uh, are we going to discuss if we are more uh, going to discuss a national strategy, national developments, the needs to have capacity building uh, in uh, to strengthen the resilience uh, of our own uh, infrastructure. Um, so, yeah, that will be concretely the effort is to uh, to make an well to make an effort uh, to share information and to uh, to contribute to the discussion. Um, and maybe you know again building on that, how do you how do you make sure that you know a lot of the conversation that obviously take place takes place diplomat to diplomat but how do you make sure that you build the relationship not just at that levels but like bringing it back down to the technical community to the technical experts within the different ministers within the 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 different tech companies as well <laughs> um i think Clear expectations and goal setting for these uh, conversations are important. Um, what are we trying to get to? Um, so everybody has a clear understanding going into this initiative for discussion, what we're trying to, to achieve. Also from a private sector perspective, understanding what the possible limitations are uh, of private sectors. Um, be that you know a lack of ability to look into attribution, or also understanding that we have user trust issues as well. You know, of our own customers, um, I think that's very important. So, understanding everybody's kind of 
positions and, and, and red lines, if you want to call them that, um, is clear to build trust, to then progress with a conversation which hopefully we can achieve some goal. Uh, and what is that goal? So really kind of level setting from, from the outset, I think, is, is particularly important. Thank you. We've been up here for an hour, which seems like it flew by, at least to me. But So I, I have one question that I will pose, and then I will open uh, the floor. So, so encourage you all to think I already see one question. My question is, you know, we, we touched upon some of the CBMs that are um, different regions, different countries are using co points of contacts, uh, critical infrastructure protection. Um, what are some of the gaps that you are seeing? Do, you, you, do, we, do we just need to focus on implementing and, and continued implementation, rather, um, of existing agreements at CBMs? Or are there areas that you see would be good for us to try and come up with new processes, new, me new methods, new models? So I'll just make a point, and I think um, I've spoken to my colleagues, and I think that at some point, uh, while the regional efforts are good, I think uh, CBMs can also be transferred between region and region, and uh, points of contact, I mean, there's nothing really stopping you from expanding the points of contact and sharing the directory with OSCE, for example. I mean, the nature of the cyber domain is transboundary, it doesn't make sense to just have CBMs within a region. So I think that uh, we have started bringing, uh, working with our colleagues from the Organization of American States, certainly with the EU, OSCE. I think there's lots of hope, but that's the gap, really, because the danger is really to feel satisfied that we are coming up with measures for your own region, forgetting that this is a transboundary problem, which doesn't respect the region. Thank you. I couldn't agree more. I mean, the interregional part and figuring out also how the ex the experiences from the respective secretariats uh, help each other um, quite a lot in, in in identifying the most effective ways in supporting the member states within the regions, but also then ex exchange the points of contact networks, for example. Um, we really see that uh, the appetite within the OEC is very much focused on implementation on the existing agreements. Um, I'm sure you could find uh, a lot of gaps or a lot of components that could be added, but in the end, it is already a, a, a sort of a long laundry list of things that are crucial and have been identified and agreed upon, and so therefore the existing capacities and, uh, and um, uh, structures by the countries are really used to now putting more meat on the, the skeleton of the CBM body in that sense. Um, from uh, my perspective, um, I don't really know if we can al already uh, see if there is CBMs, uh, any gaps uh, on uh, any, well, there will be always uh, new CBMs that we can develop. Um, indeed, there is a need to have this interconnection between the regional organization. I, I see the value able to have uh, CBMs develop in the region because uh, it certainly takes into account a common interest, but also regional concerns. Um, so that's a valuable uh, value of uh, develop uh, DCBMs in uh, orga regional organization. Um, or, and but then after to work um, together. Um, but I would say that maybe what is missing is to have a, a clear idea of where we are in terms of implementations, not to, to have an idea of what is the uh, uh, degree, uh, if it's working or not, but just where we stand, uh, what are we doing, what is uh, effective to uh, build trust and transparency and uh, stability. And I would say that this is also why the EU is um, promoting uh, to uh, advance a common understanding of the, of, um, the cyberspace uh, stability and uh, the application of international law, how concretely implement norms of responsible state behavior uh, in order to prevent conflict uh, is to really to share information and uh, to be transparent. Thank you. Um, with that, I'm going to open it. Um, if you could introduce yourself um, as you speak. Um, I don't think we have mics, but I will repeat your question.
I have to say that this is my second IGF. This kind of panel is why I think IGF is the best international meetings I ever attend. It's amazing to have Microsoft and Salesforce with the OSCE and ASEAN, and the EU is like so un unusually the smallest uh, member, sort of in a way. Uh, but the um, this kind of thing is cybersecurity has made it clear that we need these kinds of cooperation. But I put it to you that in the digital era, there's a lot of things where we have these transnational actors that are private that we have that maybe need to have a different governance role. So do you see the kinds of things that you're doing here having impact outside of security? Or do you think there's something special about security? And so CDM is something only you know, into this, this domain. For example, revenue, uh, uh, wealth transfer. Does anyone want to take the question? I, mean, I, can I, I think that water. the, I just will give a quick answer, and I think that the consciousness is growing. I, I, I think it's certainly, as I said from the beginning, uh, I'm from the Cybersecurity Agency of Singapore. It's a cybersecurity agency, a security agency is not really found in such panels previously. But I think as a government, as, as governments, as regions, we realize that uh, many of the adjacencies of cyber, I mean, we call it cyber adjacencies, you might, call it, you might call cyber a digital adjacency, but the fact is we need to be aware of all these issues and the economic uh, impact of security. So I think the conversations that many governments are having, many regions are having, is how to balance the security and economic imperative. And certainly, you're correct. The consciousness is growing. Uh, whether it will, what it will evolve into, it really depends on conversations like this. That's my perspective. I mean, in a way, the CBMs are sort of a baseline for much more, right? We are trying to grow something here. We we f we put in the seeds and see whether it's going to be a tree or a rose or we don't know yet. You know, we'll have to figure out where we, how we get there. But we we're using something and we're we're sort of uh, planting it together and then work in a collaborative way and see whether it's going to be greater economic benefit or more uh, international uh, collaboration on sort of disarmament or other things. So for me, the key takeaway here is sort of increasing the potential for for greater cooperation. I. Do you want to go? Uh, well, just briefly, yes. I mean, as Cloudflare, the way that we look at this is this also seeps into democratic systems. I mean, if we look at the, the electoral protection initiatives that, you know, companies like Cloudflare and Microsoft, I know, was also super involved in this as well. This goes really to the core of our democratic systems. Um, so for us, it's, it's, it's key. Um, yeah, I mean, it, 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 it sounds a little abstract up at the cybersecurity level, but if, if you, you look at kind of the, the impact on some of these initiatives, again, on, on the democracy levels, um, they, they are so important and they impact all of us as a society. Um, so I think that's something to, to bear in mind as well. Okay. Um, um, this other, other questions in the room? Otherwise, I think I would also add that um, I think it's slightly different because the stakeholders that you, the interlocutors, are slightly different, right? I think the cyber and security, in particular, a lot of the 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 perspective that countries bring is your traditional national security, military conversations, which is slightly different from what you what you hear in IGF t typically. And I think it would be good, I, I see access now, uh, it would be good to also sort of have a perspective on you know, how civil society can engage in some of these conversations on CBN, on norms, uh, because you know, industry, they're, they're, there's a clear role. I think everybody's realizing it. And how do we make sure that we bring civil society in would be interesting as well. Do you want to go?
not everybody gets to be in New York, so, so I think that will be very good. So if you can tell us a little bit what we can expect. And then another question more specifically to um, the Cloudflare and to Microsoft. Will you be in the room? Because I was looking at, so in the summertime, uh, there was this list that was circulated of people who were non-Equisoft entities that wanted to participate in the meeting. And in the end, some governments simply just opposed the list completely. And there were many, many civil society organizations, but there was only Microsoft as a private sector entity that had tried to register, and the web, which I don't know if I can consider them, well, they're private, but, uh, uh, but they were there. But we didn't see Cloudflare, we didn't see uh, Symantec, we didn't see any of these other private um, sector entities, which clearly have a, a role in the cybersecurity of our infrastructure. Um, so I was wondering if Cloudflare was going to be there next week, and what would be your objectives in terms of the norms, the CBMs, uh, and your role in all of that, and trying to convince states that you need to be at the table for the open-ended working group meetings as well, and not just in these market conversations. Thank you. So I'm going to repeat the question, because the previous one wrote out for the online uh, group, but I think this one didn't. So uh, the question is, what can we expect next week at the... At really quick summary at the UN um, Open Ended Working Group Intercessional uh, as a first part and the second part is, um, I guess, how, how, the, how does the industry play in that role and sort of will we participate? I'll, I'll do the, the first part, which is on the Intercessional Multi-Stakeholder Meeting next week. Thanks for the question. Uh, I just want to preface that by what happened in September at the Open Ended Working Group and I was there and I, you know, this is the first open-ended working group dealing with cyber discussions at the UN. And we were all heartened by something which is we're hoping to repeat next week. The first thing we were heartened by was the fact that I think there were close to 120 countries, 120 to 30 countries which were there. And countries took part in a, in a, in a positive, in a substantial way. The discussions were positive and substantial around the six areas of the mandate of the OEWG that was supposed to cover. So that has prefaced the idea of, of an inclusive discussion, um, not, just, not just among a few countries which, which had things to say, but by, I mean, you had, you had countries, developing countries speaking with such conviction. And so next week, what's going to happen is going to be three days of, uh, of, of meetings where, where stakeholders from industry, NGO, civic, civil society groups, academia are going to be in the same room and they're going to be contributing ideas and their thoughts on all six areas under the OEWG mandate. And I think this is a powerful opportunity as you have, have said. And if everyone brings the same energy that we had seen from players and countries which had hitherto not taken part, I think then the OEWG momentum will, will grow and we will hear perspectives because the states are going to be in there too. And they're going to be hearing what the, what the uh, multi-stakeholders have to say about each one of these things. So this is what's going to happen next week. And uh, as you have pointed out correctly, I think it's, it's what each participant makes out of it as they bring into the room. So with that, I'll pass on to Cloudflare. And my short answer is no. Uh, we would adore to be there. Unfortunately, um, we don't have the scale of some of the other larger companies, such as Microsoft. We have three policy people globally. Uh, we're really stretched. Uh, I hope that will change because no doubt we see the importance. Um, we would love to be there. It's just not possible at this time for, for to attend this particular meeting next week. And, and I will I will say I will build on that. I think we will obviously be there. But um, there are also um, I think industry will be represented through a number of different uh, industry bodies. Uh, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce will be there. The International Chamber of Commerce will be there. I think they're both preparing remarks. And the Cybersecurity Tech Accord will be there. They, they're, they're speaking. The, also, there is a reception, if anyone is there. Uh, we are organ the Cybersecurity Tech Accord is organizing with the Irish government. Um, so you can sort of talk to either of us afterwards. But, um, but, but I agree. I think there is a need to um, raise awareness of the importance of these discussions, not just across um, the countries around the world, but, but the industry at large as well, uh, for sure. 
Um, and to uh, continue, um, certainly it will also answer the first question um, about the EU contribution uh, to this kind of dialogue. Uh, I will take again my example of this uh, EU Cyber Direct project uh, that is uh, facilitating the dialogue with civil society, technical users, uh, academia, and the private sector, not only with the European uh, member states, but also with the uh, those NGOs from the third partners. Um, and uh, so in that regard, we they sponsored the participation of 29 uh, experts uh, in New York from all region, uh, and is providing a framework of discussion um, to develop a bit more the, on the thematic uh, issues that will be developed during this uh, OEWG intersessional session. Um, because what we are... Um, Not noticing is that uh, we need uh, also to facilitating uh, the discussion between business, uh, private sector, uh, civil society, and the government uh, to to build uh, to yes to go towards a common understanding on what are really the issues for each um, each respective uh, actors. Thank you. Thank you. Are there other questions in the room? Comments? or online. Oh, go ahead. Elaine, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. <laughs> um, my name is Elaine Korsak, and I'm a professor at the Missouri Institute of International Studies at Monterey. Okay, again. Hi, um, my name is Elaine Korsak. I'm a visiting professor at the Middlebury Institute of International Studies at Monterey, which is in California. Um, my question is, we've heard a lot about sort of the open-ended working group, a little bit about the GGE, how the UN process un is unfolding. I wanted to think a little bit further out. Um, where do you see this whole conversation about confidence building measures and adjacent to that capacity building measures in 10 years, seven to 10 years from now? Problem solved, new problems, still the same problems? That's a difficult question. <laughs> Who wants to take it? The honest answer would be, I don't know. Uh, I think it really depends on how we make progress on our implementation, whether there's going to be uh, additional sets of CBMs within the OEC, or we'll just stick with what we have and continue working on them. Uh, that very much also depends on how the participating states want to bring this further, how this uh, is sort of fits within their interests, within their own priori priorities. So honestly, I'm not going to make a prediction because I simply don't know. For me. So I'm feeling positive today. It could be the breakfast, but I, <laughs> I'm feeling positive. I think uh, when we started out in ASEAN in 2016, 2015, um, lots of things were being done. And I see that um, practically such discussions of strategies. So we've got, we've got three or four ASEAN countries already setting up a central cybersecurity agency. Uh, and it's not, it's not, you know, a given that governments will move so quickly to set up agencies. So Indonesia, Malaysia, I think Brunei is going to set up, Philippines has got. So even in governmental organization, if you're talking about POC directory, it means that there is a POC. And in a fragmented national landscape, it's difficult if there are many people in charge of cyber, but slowly we're seeing people appointing agencies to be in charge of this discussion. So that's from an organizational viewpoint. So that's important from CBMs, because you pick up a phone if you don't know who to call, if you're calling four people who are saying four different things, you're stressed. The second thing is that I think countries in ASEAN at least, uh, you find that they're coming up with strategies. Malaysia is going to be launching a strategy, I don't know, you know, very soon we hear. And a couple of countries, Singapore's got a strategy. And so these are positive steps forward, which may look like tiny baby steps, but they are important in, in actualizing the CBMs. And then at the regional level, I'd already shared about the ASEAN leaders doing things, agreeing on things. And I think with uh, the help of Japan and uh, Malaysia and uh, Singapore, we set up the ISM and ICTs. So I think the prognosis is positive. We might, I think the only unknown may be technology moving very quickly. And I think one of the things we need to square away is internally how to deal with cyber crime, cyber, cyber security, defense related cyber. So there may be new problems coming, but I don't think the present problems are unseen or unheard. They are being dealt with. So that's my perspective. 
Um, so I, I would also not uh, undermine the outcome in 10 years, uh, and I don't really see how it uh, could go, but CBMs um, is something, well, I studied this story, and uh, I mean in terms of uh, preventing uh, conflict and uh, reducing tension, uh, it's not because we now have a name of what is confidence building measures uh, that is never exist before, so uh, if I look forward, uh, CBMs will be and will continue to be one of the most effective measures to prevent conflict. Um, you mentioned the OEWG and UNGG, and I presume that you wanted to have an idea of what could be the concrete outcome of this discussion uh, that are still ongoing. So uh, I would say that uh, what we observe is that there is different level of CBMs in the multilateral fora, but also in regional organization and also bilaterally. Um, so, uh, or maybe in, a, in the same uh, way than uh, C2, uh, to be positive CBMs will uh, always uh, exist and uh, also implementing in a certain degree. Um, thank you. Um, I feel this this almost kind of sort of is a good wrap up question, but I will I will ask all of our panelists to sort of maybe provide a few concluding remarks um, just at the end to say thank you and sort of what are the some of the things that most st stuck with you to this conversation and then we will slowly um, allow you to go get lunch. Do you wanna do you wanna start on this side? Sorry, I got distracted by lunch, but. Uh... <laughs> So I just want to say that um, the most important thing is the to, in our in our perspective is that there's a there's a great need for capacity building. Um, it is something that needs to be done in a coordinated way. The more we do capacity building, the more we realize we need to work with lots of people across regions and as well as industry. And uh, as I said earlier, the GFCE is doing great work, and uh, we look forward to working with people in, in implementing and building capacity for, to implement both norms and CBMs. So that's my thoughts. Yeah, I guess I, I'm feeling relatively positive. I mean, I see a lot of work, at least in my own European world context, um, a lot of good initiatives happening. Um, we saw this with the elections this year of Europe, a lot of member states and tabletop exercises and information sharing coming together also with the, the private sector. Um, if the Cybersecurity Act, as you mentioned, um, we have ANISA, we have talk of a new possible EU cyber defense agency, um, certainly the, the awareness is there. Um, my sense is this ebbs and flows a little bit. I mean, we're at a particularly high peak of geopolitical tension, let's say, and I think that was well reflected in the comments at the opening ceremony yesterday by the UN uh, Secretary General, also Angela Merkel as well. Um, I, you know, it's just a moment in which it's uh, sort of protectionism and every man for his, himself, uh, that, that kind of narrative is not helpful at the minute in a time we, we should be trying to pull together and solving some of these things on, on a global level and we should be trying to build trust. So. Um, I think it's just a particularly stressful moment in which some of these narratives are not helping. Digital sovereignty, if read the wrong way, although Angela Merkel clarified it, you know, didn't mean protectionism, but you know, if translated in the wrong way, it sort of becomes more of a building walls kind of, you know, everybody cornering in on their own little piece of turf. Um, you know, that, 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 that's kind of a, a risk. Um, so we need to work to kind of continue to break down these barriers uh, to pull together and do this on a global level. So um, as was mentioned earlier, not just looking at our own regions, but how do we interconnect be between the regions? Um, but I guess I'm an eternal optimist anyway as a person, so I do hope for um, continued progress on this front. Thank you. Um, I would say that we have a roadmap for conflict prevention and stability in the cyberspace. Um, we always, we urge a lot that there is this image of uh, norms and international law or norms and CBMs are two sides of the same coins, but I prefer the image of a Mobius uh, strip. 
uh, we have a framework, we have existing uh, international law that applies in the cyberspace and we have uh, complemented this framework by uh, norms and concrete norms uh, to be implemented uh, for responsible state behavior and we further complement uh, this uh, uh, efforts to have uh, to assess the state intention via confidence building measures uh, to have cooperative uh, efforts. Uh, so yes, I would say that we have uh, uh, at a multilateral level and now through capacity building, through efforts from uh, national, uh, 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 through national efforts, uh, we are going towards uh, a stability, a stable cyberspace. So in terms of takeaways for me, I think it's great that this is a fairly diverse uh, panel. As was mentioned already, I think that the IGF is sort of uh, encouraging that kind of conversation here is phenomenal uh, and uh, very, very helpful. Um, my personal takeaways here are clearly that you know, the, the capacity building angle uh, on this work is crucial and will play definitely a greater role and is sort of a great hook for us to make sure that um, sort of the diplomatically agreed language is actually you know, translated into concrete efforts uh, across the world. Um, it also gives us a very strong um, sort of clear path for collaboration and I think that's something that we should uh, focus on and, and uh, sort of hone and support uh, and that's something that uh, I see also sort of great potential for uh, non-governmental entities to really make sure that sort of governments make sure that they continue to put an effort in this collaborative path. And then lastly, I think since we've been talking about like, this broad topic of cybersecurity, uh, and IGF is all about a lot about tech, but I think this panel also reflects that it's very much about people. You know, we need to make sure that this conversation uh, is uh, clearly connected to the individuals, uh, to the people, because trust building in the end is not done between sort of, uh, uh, a critical infrastructure provider and their servers, but amongst representatives of these entities and the people that sort of work together, especially in terms of crisis. Thank you. Um, thank you all. I think if I, I worry that it falls to me to be the voice of doom, so I will try not to do that. Um, although I, I feel path forward is less than rosy. But um, I think we can all take from the panel and the conversation that you, states are increasingly um, aware that cybersecurity is important. They're investing in the capacity. Hopefully that will mean that you know we are able to bring them all to a similar level, now that we have some that are way ahead. Um, I think the conversations here today also clear, sort of made it really clear that confidence building measures, irrespective of what happens on, on the sort of conflict and stability online, will be critical to try and uh, rein that back in uh, if something happens. So it's important that we invest, we work together um, as a community more, more than anything else um, to make sure they're implemented and their the trust begins to emerge across both allies, but, but between different stakeholder groups, between uh, potential enemies, uh, using quotation marks. Uh, but um, with that, I want to say thank you. Uh, really, really interesting panel, interesting conversation, and thank you for the audience to participating for the questions. And um, I will say, I hope that many of you will actually make it to New York next week as well.
ça se sert.
Das vierte Mikrofon wäre hier.